Your Honor, uh, this case is an extremely important case, and the reason why it is extremely important, like everything that's been associated with this larger matter, is that today in state court is the first time that we're going to see accountability for abuse of the state court system. And it's a very complex way in which it was done, but I have to remind the court that these were, this is a state lawyer who had a state law license, who abused that state law license in state court actions before state court judges, with state court settlements, and state court, things that happened within the state of South Carolina. And that's how the system was abused, and that's why it demands a Resolution. The state judicial system has to have accountability for someone who has abused that very system. And this case started much around the same time that the Attorney General's Office first got involved with this larger matter, and that was at the beginning of September 2021, not long after the side of the road happened. And by the side of the road, I mean that time where Alec Murdoch reported that he had been shot by an assailant in the wake of it coming out from his law firm that they believed he had been stealing money and stealing money for a long time. And one of the first things that SLED and the state grand jury and the attorney general's office, state grand jury section did, was start to investigate those financial crimes. And as we looked into that, one of the first things we heard from Mr. Fleming was that he had been hoodooed by Ellick just like everyone else. That he had been tricked. That he had been one of the ones led down the path by the deceit of Ellick Murdoch. And that he had been most tricked in the case involving the Satterfields. And here today, I believe, is Eric Bland, who represents the Satterfields. Uh, the Satterfields are not in attendance, but will be in attendance, is my understanding, in any sentencing, and, and will address the court at the appropriate time, assuming this plea goes forward. But we heard that, and the state grand jury continued to subpoena evidence and interview witnesses, prepare testimony for grand jury in their early fall of 2021. And one of the first things that happened is the state grand jury staff, we have a forensic accountant, Carson Barty here. I have uh, my co-counsel, Johnny James here. And then one of the first things that we uncovered was that Mr. Fleming had been stealing money out of the Satterfield account, independent of anything to do with Alec Murdoch and fake money. And as we continue to investigate and look into another matter, that came to our attention from payments that were made to the Fake Forge account. The Pinkney case came to our attention, Ms. Pamela Pinkney. And that was one of the big cases that Alec had. It was a huge recovery, but he had to bring Corey in to represent Pamela Pinkney because she had been a driver in that particular incident. And one of the things we saw, and I'll go through this in greater detail in a moment, was Corey Fleming, authorizing money going from the trust account that should have gone to Pamela Pinckney and instead sending that to PMPD, which Alec Murdoch then promptly converted. And as we look further at that, we started looking at the expenditures. And one of the things that we saw over and over again as we look at this case, as we look at how the system is abused, is that when settlements were received, these attorneys would often retain and trust an amount sufficient to cover any medical liens that were on the case. And what they're supposed to do, as your honor's well aware, what they're supposed to do and what they often do is then negotiate with those medical providers for a lesser amount. So if it's $200,000, hey, we'll pay you 125. And then if the medical provider agrees, what they're supposed to do as a service to their client is then return that delta, return that difference, that $75,000 to their client. But instead, for Mr. Fleming, that was an opportunity to steal, to steal some of that money. And Your Honor, I'm going to uh, go through 
go through some exhibits, so please bear with me. charges that we will go through here as part of the factual basis here today. And if we look at this particular chart, you can see at the top you have the three Satterfield Forge checks. You have three checks of expenses that Mr. Fleming stole independently from the Satterfield account. You have two amounts that Mr. Fleming stole from the Pinckney Trust Settlements. You have uh, the nearly $89,000 that instead of delivering to his client Pamela Pinkney, he instead sent to Ellick, as well as a, another check of fake expenses that he delivered to Ellick. And the state's total amount calculated of loss attributable to the actions of Corey Fleming and his law license and his abuse of that is $3,725,203.85. First document I want to hand up to your honor, and this is, that was State's Exhibit 1, I was just talking about, this is State's Exhibit 2. And this is one of the first checks back in 2011 that Mr. Fleming delivered to Pamela Pinckney. And I've talked to Ms. Pinckney in great detail. I've talked to her counsel. And one thing about that is, is Mr. Fleming did what a lawyer is supposed to do and communicated with Ms. Pinckney, developed a relationship with Ms. Pinckney. And you can see right there, that's a normal payment. It's from the Moss Coon and Fleming uh, trust account, and it's made out to Ms. Pinckney, as it should be. And I point that out the normal one because we'll see how things change down the line. Your Honor may recall that back in 2010, 2011, the South Carolina Gamecocks won the College World Series back to back. Mr. Fleming is a huge Carolina fan, as was Alec Murdoch. And they wanted to go to 2012, which was the third appearance. Gamecocks ended up losing that one, but it was the third appearance. And as we were looking at that delta, that difference between what Mr. Fleming had retained in his trust account of Pamela Pinckney's money and what he had actually settled the lien for, we said, that's, we got to look at those expenses. That's where something's fishy. And one of the things we saw in there was a reference for a medical expense to Crosswind. A medical expense to crosswind. Well, something didn't seem right about that, and state grand jury staff and SLED started looking around, and instead of finding any medical entity called crosswind, what we found, Your Honor, you can see the invoice right here, was a crosswind aviation, which provides private plane services. And so SLED goes and interviews the pilot, and he's like, yeah. I took Alec and Corey out to the uh, College World Series. They wanted a private plane to go out there and party, have a good time. There was no business to be discussed. Hey, they took me out for drinks. It was, a, it was to go to the College World Series. This, Your Honor, was August 21st, 2012. And this represents counts five and six of Indictment 2022-GS4702. 20, One fake check paid out of the trust account belonging to Pamela Pinckney for the amount of $6,490 to pay for a private plane so they could go party at the College World Series, and number two would be a check for $1,588.46. Back as far as 2012, the facts have shown Mr. Fleming has been stealing along with his buddy out of Florida. 
And so instantly we knew that things were different. That this claim from Mr. Fleming that he had been hooted by Alec Murdoch like everybody else was not true. And then as we go on deeper, we discover that he was a willing co-conspirator for nearly a decade with this man. And we'll start to go through those facts right now. Here. Your Honor, I, I think that this case, and when we do this factual basis, and the reason why we're having to go to such detail is not only because it's complex, and because it's important to the state judicial system that the truth and the light be shown on how it can be abused, and that there be accountability for that. But also, I think that in the end, what we're going to see here is kind of like if this was traffic court and I'm the trooper. And Mr. Fleming, and the speed limit is 55, and Mr. Fleming's going to, I think, stand up and admit, hey, I was doing 58. And if I'm a trooper, I'm saying, no, Your Honor, we clocked him doing 90, and he was weaving in and out of traffic like it was a video game. That's going to be the rub here. And the real rub is going to be, what did Mr. Fleming know was going to happen with those millions of dollars that he delivered to Alton Murdoch that were supposed to go to the Satterfields and never did? That's going to be the rub. Because he's going to admit, I believe, that he stole money and that he openly conspired with the defendant and that he, by doing so, committed the crimes of breach of trust and money laundering and computer crime and the various ones that we've alleged. But he's going to say, I believe, that he didn't know when he delivered those checks to Alec Murdoch that Alec was going to convert any of that money. And Your Honor, the facts that we're going to go through here as quickly as I can are going to show otherwise. And one thing I have to point out, and this is uncharged conduct, but in 2012 to 2014, after or around the same time that Mr. Fleming is stealing money to pay for his private plane trip out to see the College World Series, he has a case where his family member is the defendant. And Another family member is the plaintiff, essentially. And what they do in that case is really what happens in Satterfield. Essentially, Mr. Fleming, who's effectively the defendant, is doing the work and using Alec Murdoch's name with his consent, who's supposedly the plaintiff's lawyer. And then they put in an order that is signed by a judge that the plaintiff's lawyer, Mr. Murdoch, supposedly, is receiving $48,000 in legal fees, but it doesn't go to Mr. Murdoch. It goes in his pocket. It's the same thing, just in reverse. It's the plaintiff's lawyer and the defense, defendant essentially conspiring to put money that's supposed to be for the plaintiff into the defendant's pocket. And so when he tries to claim to you later on that when Satterfield happened, when he was at his dirtiest, his motives were most pure. And he thought all that money was going to the boys, even though he never contacted them, never had any interaction with them. We know he knows how to do that because he did that with Miss Pinckney, but he never had any interaction with the Southfield boys. And his own staff testified that everything Mr. Fleming did in the Satterfield matter was different. It was totally different. It was not the way it was supposed to be. So think about that, Your Honor, I would ask, and I would respectfully submit, when you hear him try to claim that even though he was stealing some money, he thought that when he gave all that money to the defendant, that the defendant was actually going to get every single dime out of the point. Because he didn't. The man he had been stealing with for a decade. That was 2012 to 2014 that that occurred. Well, what's the next thing that we see? In 2017, There's still some money left in Mr. Fleming's trust account that belongs to Pamela Pinckney. And all of a sudden, he sends an email to his staff saying, hey, we can disperse this money now. This is years later. This is 2017, when the first disbursement, as I just showed you, was from 2011.
And he says in his email to his staff, he says, uh, we can disperse this money now. I need you to cut us some checks. But first, uh, we have some expenses uh, that Alan Murdoch has. So please cut a check for $4,000, roughly $4,500, and make that out to Alan Murdoch. And it's not legit at all. There's no expenses. That was Pamela Pinkney's money. And Mr. Fleming gave it to Mr. Murdoch. Your Honor, that's count nine of 2022 GS4702. Are you in, are we in Hampton County at this point? Yes, sir, I'm going in chronological order because I think you need to understand how things develop. And I apologize if I'm jumping around a little bit, uh, but it's important, I think, that we understand how this developed. And we have to go in chronological order so you can understand the entire decade course of conduct of this man and his law license. And yes, 2022 GS4702, that would be the Hampton indictment, Your Honor. Uh, but what he also did, was have his staff cut a check from his trust account, not to Pamela Pinkney for the $89,000 that's remaining, but have it cut to PMPED. And it goes to PMPED and Alec promptly converts it through the use of the Faith Forge account. He had had a relationship with Ms. Pinkney for a long time. And over and over again, we talk to staff, and, and your honor knows this, there is no better for people doing this kind of work, there is nothing better, whether it's the attorney or the staff, than calling up the client and saying, guess what? I am the best lawyer in the world. I got $89,000 you didn't know you were getting. I, come on down, get your check. I think it says a lot that he doesn't call Miss Pinkney at all. He does not call her at all to say, guess what, Miss P? I got $89,000 for you. Bonus, Merry Christmas. Instead, it gets converted. That, Your Honor, is count seven and eight of the Hampton County indictment, 2022 GS4702. A big part of this case is the fake forge. And Your Honor, I know that, that you understand these concepts, but I think you're gonna hear from the defense that Mr. Fleming, despite this being his business, is going to claim that he doesn't. And the way structures work, a structured settlement works, is, and the idea of course, is that if a client's going to get a large settlement, to put it into an annuity. So instead of getting one lump sum, kind of like the lottery, instead of getting one lump sum, it's gonna be in an annuity where they're gonna get regular payments, and that way they get steady income for an extended period of time, and it helps them manage their money. It's a very common thing for plaintiff's lawyers to do for clients. But what Forge does, the real Forge, Forge Consulting, it does not provide any annuity. It does not take money in the, in the standard sense. It does not, it is only there as a consultant to match up a client with an annuity company that's going to provide the best rate of return at that particular time. It is a consultant. But what has to happen is the money has to go direct from the insurer for the defendant or the defendant themselves with their deep pocket and it has to go straight to that annuity it cannot at any time go to the lawyer or the conservator or the pr or the client themselves because the second that happens that's constructive receipt and that blows the tax advantages out of the war it's a basic concept for anyone who's doing plaintiff's work which mr fleming did for decades So two things about that, Your Honor. Number one is the check cannot be made out to the client or to the lawyer or to the conservator or the PR. It has to go direct. That's the first thing. And the second thing is Forge doesn't take money. And the lawyers know this. Mr. Fleming is a lawyer. My handout looks been marked as States Exhibit 5, <clears throat> Your Honor. And this is a very significant email 
because it's an email from one of Mr. Fleming's staff members to the principal person at Forge. And Mr. Fleming, of course, is copied. In fact, the staff member says, and, and of course, like these emails, you have to read them from the back page going up. But what the staff member says is, Corey asked me to send you this letter. And if we see down at the bottom of the first page, the principal at Forge, of the real Forge, explains to them in great detail that because they already had the check cut to them, they didn't do it right. And the only solution they have if they want to set up a structure is to send the money back and get the check recut because they've already had the constructive receipt. So if there was any doubt at all about whether or not Corey Fleming, as a plaintiff's lawyer, understood the reality of how this works, this email blows that out of the water. And there's others, too, that I'll get to in a minute. And why is that important? Because as I get to, when he hands those checks from his trust account, made out to just the word forge, and he doesn't mail them, he doesn't call the Satterfields, he doesn't call the PR, he either directly or constructively hands those checks directly to Elmer. And two things are important. Number one, he knows that doesn't work. And number two, he knows Forge doesn't take money. Forge doesn't do that. They don't have accounts. They're a consultant. They're a broker, essentially. And this was explained to him in great detail in that exhibit right there. Miss uh, Satterfield, who was a longtime housekeeper for the Murdochs, fell and ultimately died from that fall at the home in Moselle in February of 2018. And your honor's already heard information about how Alec told the Satterfield boys that, and the Satterfield family that he was going to help the boys. Make sure they were taken care of for Gloria's long service to his family. And he tells the boys, I'm going to get this lawyer involved who's going to take care of you. His name is Corey Flynn. But if you talk to the family, if you talk to Tony Satterfield, they rarely have ever heard from Mr. Fleming. In fact, maybe the most significant thing that Mr. Fleming ever did was get Tony Satterfield to come down and sign over his responsibility as the PR so they could give it to Chad Westendorf from Palmetto State Bank so that the scheme could operate. And Chad Westendorf, I believe, was just a patsy of this. He doesn't talk to the Satterfield boys. He's dispersing millions of dollars and doesn't call them up. He doesn't explain things to Chad Westendorf. And I think that tells you everything you need to know about his claim that he really, at his start, thought that they were getting that money when he handed it, made out to Forge, which doesn't work, to the, to the other, his co-defendant, Al Murray. So in March of 2018, uh, we see first evidence of Mr. Fleming getting involved in the Satterfield case. In November 12th, 2018, there's a, two policies at issue. There's a Lloyd's of London policy and there is a Nautilus policy. The Lloyd's has 500K, 505 it turns out to be. And on November 12th, 2018, Lloyd's tender, sends a letter and tenders the policy limits.
I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 6, Your Honor, and this is an email from Corey to his staff member, November 13, 2018, and attached to it was the letter from the defense attorney for the Lloyds of London Insurance Company, pretty much saying, we're going to tender the policy limits. And what does Mr. Fleming say? He tells his staff member, we need to hold this until we can get the PR changed. We need to hold this until we get the PR changed. That's on November 28, 2018, Your Honor, before disbursement. So he holds on to that settlement. He doesn't call the Satterfields and say, great news. He brings Tony in and gets him to sign over his duties as PR to Chad Westerwood. And so when that money gets dispersed to Forge and handed to Alec Murdoch, Again, it's inconsistent with this idea that Mr. Fleming thought that that money was really going where it was supposed to be. It doesn't make sense. Unless his defense is, I am the dumbest man alive. And we all know about Corey Fleming, who's been a lawyer for a long time, he's not the dumbest man alive. The appointment of Chad Westendorf to replace Tony Satterfield to have now Mark the state seven, which I'll hand up to the court, is signed by the probate court on December 18th, 2018. And it actually refers back to March of 2018 as supposedly the effective date. At that time, your Honor, the $505,000 check from Lloyd's in London had already been cut on December 4th, 2018. They already had Chad written down as the PR. And Your Honor, that's going to be States 8 that I'll hand up. States 8 is the check dated. December 4th, 2018, predating that order that I just handed you. And then we have a petition for approval of the wrongful death settlement. Your Honor, the signed on December 19th. So they've already put this in motion. And then after the fact, <coughs> go get that order signed, changing it to Chad Westendorf. And then the very next day, they are cutting the checks. And what's interesting about that petition that I just handed you, Your Honor, is it doesn't accurately reflect <coughs> what's going to happen to the money. We have states 10, 11, and 12 here, Your Honor. First one, 10, is the disbursement statement that was signed by Mr. Westendorf that was prepared by Mr. Fleming's staff, but at his direction. She started to fill out the numbers, not really understanding why. Why is this different? Why? Usually, if I have prosecution expenses, I'm going to have receipts. Mr. Fleming always provides me this information. I can calculate it. And she's like, I don't have the information. He's like, you just put these numbers down. Put these numbers down. And what's interesting is, on states 10, which is the disbursement statement, first of all, it only lists the settlement as 475, not 505. It has also on there $10,000 payment to Mr. Westendorf, but also $11,500 in prosecution expenses, which his staff says, I have no receipt of, which were fraud. Out of the gate. The disbursement sheet has fraudulent expenses on there. And then what does Mr. Fleming do? States 11, he has cut from his trust account the first check made out just to forge, the word forge, not forge consulting LLC or anything like that, just the word forge. 
and has that made out to forge, and then he causes that check to be personally delivered to Ellen Murdoch. And Alec converts it. Your Honor, this whole conspiracy that I'm talking about uh, from March of 2018, will go all the way to October of 2020, we're involving the Satterfields. This will be the Buford indictment. And this will be count 10, the conspiracy count of 2021 GS4731. And that check, that I'm, this check I'm about, or the check I just handed up to you, that first $403,500 check that went to Fake Forge that was cut from his trust account, Your Honor, that will be counts 11, 13, and 14 of 2021 GS 4731. <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Fleming, of course, has been indicted for insurance fraud along with this for essentially making a false statement in the course of a insurance settlement and obviously the insurance company knows nothing about any of this. But that's not enough for Mr. Fleming because then we see on January 18th, 2019, just about 11 days later, Mr. Fleming goes to his staff member and says, cut me a check out of the trust monies belonging to the Satterfields for $8,000 for expenses for the state of Gloria Satterfield and make it out to me, Corey Fleming Esquire. And that, Your Honor, is stage 12. And there were no such expenses. That was fraudulent. That's just straight theft. Break your trust, Your Honor. What we can infer as we look at how this was conducted was that essentially Ellick Murdoch was functioning as co-counsel, if not lead counsel, in this particular case. And in March of 2019, March 22nd, there is a mediation involving the second policy at issue for the Satterfields, and that's Mr. Murdoch's umbrella policy, and that was with Nautilus. And Mr. Murdoch is at that particular mediation. Mr. Fleming is there. And ultimately, it's pretty easy to see the insurance company kind of saw the writing on the wall and agreed to a settlement, a very large settlement. And on March 25th, 2019, there's a settlement in favor of the Satterfields of $3.8 million. As we look at the legitimate cost of prosecution that we see, the only thing we can really see is about $1,512.46. Maybe there were some travel and things like that, but that was for the mediator. But that settlement's agreed to. for Nautilus. And these are very crucial, Your Honor, as we think about what the facts show about what Mr. Fleming knew. We've already talked about the email that came from Michael Gunn. We've already talked about that Forge doesn't take money. We've talked about the issues of constructive receipt. But what this shows is, is that the adjuster for Nautilus is emailing Mr. Grantland, who's the defense attorney for Nautilus, and say, hey, we've got the settlement. I need to know some more details about how to cut this. 
Are they going to structure any of it? Do we need to have anything, a, a, a conservator appointed? And Mr. Grantland forwards that to Mr. Fleming. And Mr. Fleming says, John, order the check. The structure we have will include an administrator that serves the purpose of a conservator. And then follows up by sending him Chad Westendorf as the personal representative of the estate of Gloria Satterfield. Your Honor, that's state 13 that I hand up right now. Which doesn't work. But obviously, the insurer and the defense attorney are confused because it doesn't make sense. So they follow up with another email. The, uh, the adjuster says to the defense attorney, Mr. Graham, says, I need some clarification here. If he has a structure, don't we need to wait for information on the structure? Is he wanting us to fund the structure or is he funding it? If he wants us to fund it, it must go through Rainwater. If he doesn't want to fund the structure, does he want the funds to consist of a single check in the amount of $3.8 million payable to Chad Westendorf? And Mr. Grayland forwards that email on to Mr. Fleming saying, hey, what do you want to do, man? Mr. Fleming in Exhibit 14 says, I meant to add Moss Putin and Fleming, his law firm, to the check. I will need to check with Forge on Monday to double check. Your Honor, that's State 14 that I'll hand up at this time. The evidence shows, of course, is that Mr. Fleming has had no conversations with Will Forge during this time. He's not reached out to them. They don't have a case. He's had a few interactions with Mr. Fleming, seen him at the trial lawyer's conference, which of course is where all these kind of issues are discussed. They're a huge presence there because of the services they provide to plaintiff's attorneys. Well, that doesn't answer the question. And so, again, Mr. Grant, on March 30th, 2019, is sending the letter from the adjuster saying, please, let me know what I need to tell her. And this is Mr. Fleming's response, Your Honor. This is State 15, and this is very telling. He says, standard check. Chad Westendorf was PR, and Moss Coon Fleming is attorneys. Standard check. The question is, structure or standard check? And Mr. Fleming's answer is, standard check. If there's any illusion whatsoever about whether or not he thought there was a real structure, first of all, the way he's cutting the check doesn't work. And he answers the question right there, Mr. Grant. Standard check. While that's going on, just a few days later, three days later on April 4th, 2019, still out of the $505,000 settlement, Mr. Fleming goes to his staff member and says, I need you to cut another check out of the Satterfield money. I need you to make a check for $8,500 and make it out to me for expenses for the estate of Gloria Satterfield. No documentation, and again, those were fraudulent. And Your Honor, that's counts 25 and 26 of 2021 GS 4731. Going back to that first check he had cut in January for $8,000, when we look at his account, Your Honor, when he went down to a staff member and said, I need you to cut me this check, his account was getting really low. And at the second that money comes in, he pays his mortgage and a large credit card debt. You say he referring to? To Mr. Fleming. Mr. Fleming. Yes. When he steals that first $8,000, we look at his account, it's pretty low. And the second he gets that money in, he's making those two large payments that needed to be made. If that tells you anything about the motives, it's right there. The second check, the one I just referred to from April 4th, 2019, for $8,500, he puts that in his account. And what we see is that immediately he has to pay pretty much all of it to the IRS. And his account, again, was low. He needed that money to make that payment. He also spent some of it on video games, iTunes, and mortgage as well. Again, 
The motive is clear from his bank account when he's stealing this money. On April 11, 2019, Chad Westendorf signs the release for the Nautilus settlement on April 8, 2019. That check is sent. On May 6, 2019, they need to have a hearing for approval because it's a death case. And there's an email from Mr. Fleming telling the defense lawyer, Mr. Grandland, save the gas. If you don't need to come, I got this. On May 13, 2019, Um, and just to be clear, Your Honor, we'll get there in just a second. Um, I'm going to hand out what's been marked to state 16. And this is that second fake expense check that Mr. Fleming stole from the Satterfields that I was just talking about for State 17, Your Honor, is the email between Mr. Fleming and Mr. Grantland, in which he tells Mr. Grantland, save the gas, you don't need to come to the hearing. And so what happens after that is Mr. Fleming's, they have $3.8 million now. What, what do they do with it? Well, Mr. Fleming, his staff member, dutifully starts to try to put together a disbursement sheet, as she normally would, where she's trying to identify expenses and liens and hold that money and figure it all out and she prepares her best initial attempt which is states 18 but Mr. Fleming stops her says no 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 states 19 put these numbers down you put these numbers down and what he has on there is that he is getting $168,333.33 in attorney's fees from the Lloyd settlement, and he is getting $1,266,666.67 from the Nautilus settlement, which would be the standard percentage cut. That's very significant, too, when Mr. Fleming tries to claim, as he does, that he didn't know that Alec was going to take his half of the fees because what this the math works out to be what the math works out to be is what's very common in the plaintiff's world which is exactly what your honor heard testimony about it, the trial of Alec the fee split with Chris Wilson and when you look at the math the math works out to be a fee split between Corey Fleming and Alec Murdo and that's how the case was conducted and again if we go back, we look at what they did with the case back in 2012 to 2014 when Corey was the beneficiary of getting legal fees that were supposed to go to the plaintiff's attorney. We look at what we know about what Corey knows about how Forge works. We know that the check doesn't cut. We saw the email where he says, cut standard check. And then we look at the disbursement sheet that he actually gets Chad Westendorf to sign, and it's got the full amount of attorney fees in there. It also has $105,000 even to the nose of prosecution expenses, which are fraudulent. Doesn't exist. Theft. And ultimately, on May 13, 2019, Mr. Fleming has issued a Moscow and Fleming trust account check made out to just the word forge for $2,961,931.95. Your 
Your Honor, that's count 15, 17, and 18 of 2021 GS4731 in Beaufort County. And he causes that check to be delivered ultimately to Alan Murdoch. Does he call up the Satterfield boys and say, great news, you have life-changing money now? No. Has virtually no contact with them whatsoever. And it's very interesting that during this time, family is going through hard financial times. And Mr. Fleming and his co-conspirator, Alan Murdoch, are playing around with millions of dollars of money that belong to them. also very interesting in that disbursement sheet that he has the full attorney fee amount. And when you work out the amounts that he ultimately delivered to Alec and the amounts that he retained, the math maths, Your Honor, it works out to a fee split. It works out to about $790 for Corey and $750 for Alec with expenses included in that. The math maths, Your Honor, and the facts add up. And the only defense he has to say, and I think this is the only hiccup we have, kind of going back to, is he doing 58 miles an hour or is he rolling hot at night? His only defense is, oh, I thought when I gave those checks to my co-conspirator that all of that money, every dime of it was going to this. It didn't bother to check. I don't think he cared. Well, that's not enough for Mr. Fleming because there's still money left in the account. They still retain about $231,000 that you got to deal with now. And so on January 23rd, 2020, Mr. Fleming, I mean, we, we've gone a number of months by. I mean, we've gone seven months. And for whatever reason, Mr. Fleming goes down to a staff member and says, hey, cut me a check from the Satterfield Trust account to me personally for $9,700. And make it out for expenses for the estate of Gloria Satterfield. And what we see again is, as we look at his accounts, we see he needed that money to pay personal debts. And Your Honor, that third theft from the Satterfield, that's counts 27 and 28 of 2021 GS 4731. Still money left. Still money left. And so, on October 6th, 2020, much down the line, Alex sends, or, or uh, Corey sends, emails to his staff and says, hey, we need to disperse some more funds in the Satterfield matter. And ultimately, Mr. Fleming, yet again, causes a check for $118,000 to be made out from his trust account to, quote, forge, end quote, and has that check delivered to Ellicott. <coughs> That $118,000 is counts 19, 21, and 22 of 2021 GS4731 in Buford County. And on October 7th, 2020, that $118,000 check goes from Mr. Fleming, made out to quote for it, and goes to Alec and it promptly is converted. Mr. Fleming still has not dispersed all the money in the Satterfields. Still has $113,800 in his account. And that money that should have been dispersed to the Satterfields a long time ago is ultimately <laughs> still there when everything starts to come to light in September 20th, 2021. And you're under that final $113,800 this count 30 of 2021 GS 4731.
Start with the real quick one. We're going to take a um, break for about 15 minutes. Thank you, Ron. We'll be done shortly after that. Exhibit 20. Uh, I referred earlier that on October, in October of 2020, Mr. Fleming causes that disbursement to be made, but also prepares a stipulation of this dismissal that I've just handed up that changes the caption and is signed by Mr. Fleming, Fleming and Alec Murdoch. Anyone else is signed by Mr. Fleming and the actual defendant. And that's how supposedly everything is completed, except for, Your Honor, what I have here in the States is in 2021. And this is a, has a number of pages in it. I'm going to hand this up to the court. Uh, on the first page is the printout from the Moskun and Fleming trust account showing that 113800 that was still remaining that Mr. Fleming had not dispersed to his clients. Uh, one thing I do want to correct, Your Honor, is I said earlier I believe that Tony Satterfield had gone to Mr. Fleming's office to sign the, uh, the transfer of the PR. That's not accurate. He actually went to BMPE. Uh, but it is accurate, uh, according to the facts developed in the investigation, that Mr. Fleming only met with Tony Satterfield one time and never once called him, sent him a letter, copied him a letter, updated him, signed a fee agreement, any of those things that you normally would do, that a normal plaintiff's attorney would do, that his normal practice might have been. Everything was different in this, in this case, and his staff confirmed that. Your Honor, just real quick. Um, the third page of that exhibit I just handed up, I said earlier that the math maths. And if you look at that third page, and I'm sorry it's a little small, and this is work of the state grand jury, which of course is a partnership of the attorney general and the SLED, and I have my two SLED agents here, two of them, the men who worked on this case. Uh, one of the lead case agent on the financial side during the majority of it was uh, Senior Special Agent David Williams, who came out of retirement to work on this case and then went back into retirement. Uh, I do have Lieutenant Jeremy Smith here as well as uh, Special Agent Steve Beckley. And if you look at the math, and again, this has been, you know, this is as we look at the numbers, and then we compare that to the actual disbursement sheet that they had Chad Westenworth sign, the math maths, it works out to be a fee split. And those checks that Corey's cutting may not forge, they don't work. They don't work at all. There's no direction as to how to allocate. There's no contact with the real forge. And so for Mr. Fleming to try to claim that he didn't think Alan was getting his share of this, Your Honor, the facts don't bear that out. Common sense doesn't bear that out. These two men looked at the cases they had as if it were a pantry, and they could just open the door and goodies would just drop out. And if it hadn't been for the good work of the state grand jury staff and SLED and other partners, there would never be accountability in state court that there's going to hopefully be today, and Mr. Fleming might be on his boat wearing free thing. He might be on his what? On his boat. On his boat? Yes. Your Honor, the first uh, document I believe I handed up was a summary of all the loss amounts. And just to summarize, we've been through a lot, but I just want to go through those numbers very quickly and the indictments they represent, and then I will sit down. But for 2021 GS 4730, we have the three Forge Satterfield checks. $403,500 is the first one, January 2019. The $2.9 million check, which was May of 2019, 
The $118,000 check, which is October of 2020, when they did that very suspect simulation of dismissal, and then the 113.8 that was remaining, and the total there of money is $3,597,231.95, just for that aspect of the crimes that Mr. Fleming has committed. 2021 GS 4730, we have the three fraudulent expense checks that Mr. Fleming wrote himself or had written to him out of the Satterfield money. The first one is $8,000 on January 17th, 2019. The second is $8,500 in April of 2019. The third is $9,700 in January of 2020. And that totals $26,200. The Satterfield total combining those two amounts is $3,623,431.95. Moving on to the Pinkney matter. 2022 GS 4702, you have the two checks to crosswind that Mr. Fleming had cut, billed as a medical expense, but instead were for his party on the private plane. The first one is $6,490, the second one is $1,588.46 for a total of $8,078.46. Then you also have the check of the remaining trust amounts that belonged to Ms. P, that instead of calling her up and saying great news, he had converted for Mr. Murdoch and sent to PMPED, and that's $89,133.44. Then you have the <coughs> expense check that he had cut to Mr. Murdoch, $45.60. And so in that amount, we have $101,771.90 for a grand total attributable to Mr. Fleming's abuse of his law license in state court of $3,725,203.85. Your Honor, those are the facts as it relates to Mr. Fleming. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fleming, do you disagree with any of the statements made by Mr. Waters? Your Honor, I agree that there are um, facts uh, that Mr. Waters stated that, are, um, that establish my guilt on each of the indictments. Um, um, however, there are certain facts that are not material to my guilt uh, that I think I would like to be able to address at sentencing. Question is, do you disagree with any of, the, any of the statements by Mr. Fleming in your responses? Do you disagree with any statements made by Mr. Mr. Waters in your responses? I do disagree with some of the, some of the statements that were made by Mr. Waters, yes, sir. Um, I, I, however, agree that, um, that there, there, were, there were sufficient facts provided to court um, that I agree with that establish my guilt on each of the indictments. All right. Uh, Ms. Parvue. Yes. Any comment, response to Mr. Waters? Your Honor, um, as Mr. Fleming stated, uh, we do uh, agree that Mr. Fleming is guilty of each of the offenses and the indictments that he's pleading guilty to. Uh, we agree that there have been sufficient facts put in the record today to establish his guilt, um, that meet the elements of each of these offenses. Um, Your Honor, we have some agreements, um, some disagreements um, with respect to certain facts that I believe it's, it'll be appropriate to take up at sentencing. Mr. Waters has indicated throughout his presentation that he understands that Mr. Fleming disagrees with certain facts. Um, and I, I think he agrees that he's still guilty even though he disagrees with certain facts of these offenses. Um, I can get into you know, any specifics of anything we disagree with that the court would like, but uh, I do think it's appropriate for sentencing. We'll be prepared at sentencing to address all of those facts that we disagree with, but for today's purposes, we agree that he has established facts to establish his guilt for 
each of the offenses and each of the indictments. All right, thank you, Mr. Waters. Uh, Your Honor, I'm happy to answer any specific questions the court may have. Uh, I think uh, the state has made clear and, and just wants to make sure uh, as we move to sentencing, assuming the court accepts this plea, that the facts, as I've related them, that the facts that the investigation, the extensive investigation that revealed are still very much in play for the court's consideration in sentencing. Uh, if Mr. Fleming wants to say I'm, I'm doing 58, okay, he's doing more than 55. But I think the overwhelming weight of the facts show that he was doing 90. And we will be arguing in sentencing, assuming the court accepts the plea, I want to make sure the court will consider the state's evidence that Mr. Fleming, in fact, was doing 90. Um, Your Honor, I do need to also point out that it is the official position of the Attorney General and of SLED that Mr. Fleming has not lived up to his cooperation obligations. And that obviously could be another matter that would be discussed in sentencing. Uh, but as long as the full basis of the facts as have been presented are uh, available to be considered by the court and argued by the court. If Mr. Fleming is going to say, I've crossed over the line, and, you're, and your honor is willing to accept that plea, uh, then the state is as well, uh, assuming that we can still make the full case as we are here today. I find that there's a sufficient factual basis to establish guilt on each of the counts of the indictment. Mr. Fleming, through counsel and individually, has acknowledged guilt as to each uh, indictment, and uh, I accept the guilty pleas to each indictment. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Now, with regard to sentencing, which will not take place today, we're in General Sessions Court here in Williamsburg County. I think the proper venue for dealing with the sentencing issue uh, issues would be in the uh, would be in Beaufort County or Hampton County, wherever the um, proper venue within the 14th Circuit would be. Uh, so we'll address the other issues and all uh, at the time of sentencing that you all would like for the court to consider. Anything else that we need to talk about today on this case? Um, none from the state, Your Honor. Uh, we will obviously uh, uh, move to sentencing after that week. All right, Ms. Barbara, yeah. No, nothing else, Your Honor. I, uh, I, I understand the court will schedule it for the, is it the week of September 11th in Utah? Yeah, we scheduled to be in uh, concurrent jurisdictions, <laughs> Barnwell and Beautiful. And I'll start that week in Barnwell to see, um, and, and hopefully by the end of that week, we'll be available to come to Beaufort. Now, will you all be prepared to proceed with sentencing um, either the Thursday or the Friday of that week? So it'll be ready, Your Honor, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. And Mr. Fleming is in and they intend to hold him there until this entire matter is resolved. That's my understanding, Your Honor. And I'll um, check with the federal authorities as well. Anything on that issue? Uh, yes, sir, Your Honor. We've been arranged for him to be transported from here to Beaufort County Detention Center where he will be held at such time as you sentence him. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll um, after getting clarity on the docket in Barnwell, uh, we'll plan for sentencing the week of September 11th, most likely toward the end of the week. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, Thank sir. you all. Thank you. Thank
issued as to custody because he is in federal custody at the moment, um, and then he's been written out, as you know, into state custody? Yes. Is the position of the state that he is still in federal custody? I don't know. I mean, he's been written out. I, I, I'm not sure. Can I consult the council for a moment, Your Honor? Yes. Barbie, regarding whatever areas of disagreement or contention uh, between you and the state, uh, do you intend to submit something else to me on regarding that, or, or is it contained in what you've already submitted to me? There will likely be additional submissions, Your Honor, and additional information presented at the Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. case is State versus Russell Lucius Lafitte. Uh, he has been indicted in three state grand jury indictments. Uh, that is 2022 GS 4701 uh, in Hampton County. Uh, that was indicted in April of 2022. Uh, 2022 GS 4702 in Hampton County. Uh, that was also indicted in April of 2022. And then 2022 GS 4703 in Allendale County that was indicted in uh, Additionally, in April of 22, uh, there's a number of counts here that include criminal conspiracy, computer crime, breach of trust, 
uh, of the various uh, crimes that are against uh, Mr. Lafitte. Uh, Your Honor, uh, we had a uh, conference back in April, I believe, um, and uh, at that time, Your Honor indicated, uh, I think Mr. Rutherford, he's, uh, Mr. Lafitte is here, of course, represented by his counsel, Mark Moore and Todd Rutherford. Uh, Mr. Rutherford, I believe, had just joined the defense team, and so uh, at that time, we discussed status taking the case around this time, so we're here for that. Uh, I do believe the uh, defense has a, a number of, uh, a couple of preliminary matters they wish to address, uh, and then we can ultimately uh, discuss the status of the case. All right. Mr. Morgan and Mr. Rutherford. Yes, sir, Your Honor. I, I believe that the last time that we were in front of Your Honor, we discussed transferring some funds or the court authorizing transfer of funds from Nelson Mullins escrow account to ours. Um, I sent Mr. Waters uh, a proposed motion in order. Uh, we now have an executed copy of that joint motion, and I have an order. It's a little bit wrinkled, but if Your Honor permits, I'll hand up the motion. I believe that this is what Your Honor indicated. You would be willing to sign if the state were willing to consent to it. Um, um, and if you can explain once again what this is. Yes, sir, Your Honor. So, um, when Mr. Lafitte was originally placed on bond, uh, there were certain conditions with respect to his finances that were imposed, I believe, by Judge Lee. That was before either Mr. Rutherford or I were involved in this case. Um, but at some point, a residence was sold, and the proceeds of that of the sale of that residence were placed into Nelson Mullins' escrow account um, because of the financial conditions of the bond. And so Nelson Mullins has now withdrawn from this case, as Your Honor understands. Uh, myself and Mr. Rutherford have now been substituted as counsel. And so while all this order seeks to do is direct that the funds that are currently held in escrow by Nelson Mullins with respect to the sale of that residence be transferred to the escrow account of my law firm, and then we, we can have a discussion. At some point, Mr. Waters and I have talked a couple of times we talked again this morning um, about the possibility of allowing Mr. Lafitte to um, to perhaps liquidate some funds to pay attorney's fees, but that's not what is before you today. That is not the order that is before you today. Right, Mr. Waters. Uh, yes, sir, Your Honor. Um, again, if the whole point of this order is just to preserve the uh, integrity and uh, those funds held in trust would just transfer them to current counsel. The state has no dog in that fight or objection as long as those funds remain uh, safe until uh, you know, there's further proceedings or discussions among the parties for disposition. And that's all it's intended to do, Your Honor. But I, I do believe that an order of the court is necessary here, and that's why we seek it. The court has signed that order. All right, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I think that's, you know, Mr. Waters and I have also talked about some other things, but I think we probably ought to go to scheduling next, frankly. Um, as Your Honor knows, the last time we appeared before you, um, I had not been in the case for long. Uh, Mr. Mr. Rutherford had just joined. Since, the, since our appearance before Your Honor, um, Judge Gergel has scheduled and has now held a sentencing hearing in the federal court. Mr. Lafitte was sentenced to 84 months in federal prison. Um, he is appealing. Currently, he's appealing uh, that conviction and sentence. Um, we have asked the Fourth Circuit to grant him an appeal bond. I do not have a decision on the appeal bond as of yet, Your Honor. Um, he, uh, the, the government is required to file their response to our motion uh, by the end of this week. We'll file a brief reply, and then I assume that the Fourth Circuit will decide it in short order. Um, Your Honor should be aware that Mr. Lafitte has received a designation from the Bureau of Prisons. He had a report date of September 14th. Uh, Judge Gergel has extended that until September 21st to give the Fourth Circuit time to decide the appeal on the issue. And so I just wanted to inform the court of those facts because I think they may be relevant to the scheduling discussion that we're about to have. Okay. So perhaps I'll let, let Mr. Waters speak about scheduling. I, I'm certainly going to ask the court that it not schedule this case uh, until we get a decision on the appeal bond issue. Uh, I will tell Your Honor that uh, you know, I've spent 
no time to prepare for a state trial because I spent all my time on this case preparing to deal with his federal issues, to deal with uh, his uh, motion for a new trial, to deal with the sentencing, and now deal with the appeal. And Mr. Waters and I have talked about that, and perhaps I, I think we'll I think we're going to jointly propose another status conference with your honor after the fourth circuit decides this appeal about the issue. That's what I hope we're going to jointly propose. Mr. Waters. Uh, your honor, obviously the state has uh, throughout this matter um, and all the related matters uh, kept their foot on the gas, and that's always our intent here. Uh, we all know, of course, uh, that uh, that Mr. Uh, Representative Rutherford has his legislative duties, and obviously, if, if we don't schedule it in the fall, then there will be it will be at least the summer of next year before we can schedule that, and that's just the, the nature of of, uh, of of how things work, obviously, with uh, with the. Um, the legislative duties uh, and, and, and the courts, uh, and the Supreme Court's order in that regard. Um, I do think that it is appropriate for us to uh, to understand whether or not Mr. Lafitte is going to be reporting to prison or not. Uh, as we look to that, I don't want to completely remove any possibility of trying uh, to get this case scheduled sometime prior to the beginning of session in, in January. Uh, I do understand the defense is opposed to that, um, but the state is also thinks that we need to have all the information about what's going to be going on with Mr. Lafitte before we make that final decision. And that would be a big factor would be obviously whether or not his appeal bond is granted or denied and whether or not he would be uh, reporting to, uh, to an FCI. Well, Mr. Fleming has been sentenced already and he's, he's on his way. It, doesn't, it didn't uh, preclude any activity on his case, did it? Well, we already had that case scheduled, Your Honor. If you recall, uh, we were at that status conference in April, and I was trying to schedule them all, including Mr. Lafitte. Uh, and, of course, we had a date scheduled for Mr. Fleming at that status conference back in April. Uh, you know, again, uh, Mr. Fleming made whatever arrangements he did with the federal authorities to go ahead and surrender himself and begin serving his sentence, whereas, which is perfectly their right to do, uh, Mr. Mr. Moore, obviously, they have, uh, you know, since sentencing, they've moved for an appeal bond, and, and there has been a deferred uh, report date, so I think we just said September 21st. So that's just the, the way the attorneys on the federal side of things have, have differently conducted that matter, and that hasn't had any involvement of the state. Um, but you know, we're happy to show up uh, within reason whenever and wherever uh, and, and move matters forward. Is, is the state ready for trial? I mean, we would need some time to get subpoenas out and all the rest of it, because uh, it is a very complex matter. Um, but I mean, if there were, if, if we had, uh, you know, a couple months ago, we have another matter uh, scheduled, I believe, in November, is that right? uh, December. Um, and I think that's the only other one that's currently scheduled because of the resolution here today of this one. Um, so again, if we were, uh, right so again, if, if there were, you know, time in, in, in October or something like that. I know that the, uh, the defense is opposed to that, but the state uh, doesn't want to just back out if your honor, uh, you know, here's what they have to say about scheduling and wants to proceed forward. All right, Mr. Moore. Yes, sir, your honor. Again, as a, and I guess the difference between Mr. Fleming's case and our case is that Ms. Barbier has been representing Mr. Fleming for some time. I've been representing Mr. Lafitte uh, since January, Mr. Rutherford has only been in this case since April. I, Mr. Rutherford can speak to his own schedule. I understand that Mr. Rutherford has a difficult schedule for the fall because of trials that have been already scheduled in cases that are much older than this one. And this case, while it, it is, is a 2022 case, as I understand it, that's a relatively new case, I believe. And again, Mr. Rutherford can speak to that a little more than I. Uh, I have other matters that are scheduled in October. Uh, that I don't know that I can get out of. I also am going to need several months to prepare for a trial if I'm expected to try this case. This case is different than the federal case. In addition, I asked Mr. Waters this question this morning and I didn't get an answer, okay? And I understand that he's not ready to answer this question, but I asked Mr. Waters whether he intends to try all of these cases together in one county, and I also asked Mr. Waters if he intends to try this case with Alec Murray, okay, who is a co-defendant of Mr. Lafitte. I think we need answers to those questions, Your Honor, before we think about scheduling the case. Um, and so, for those reasons, what I would ask Your Honor to do 
As I understand it, Your Honor, is in view, your, your Honor just mentioned earlier that Your Honor is um, in, I think you said, uh, Colleton and Beaufort counties uh, the week of the 11th, is that correct? Barnwell. Bar Barnwell, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Barnwell and Beaufort counties. Yes. Um, and so, you know, if, if, for example, if Your Honor could schedule something for the 14th, um, which is towards the latter part of that week, Your Honor indicated that you were thinking about um, a sentencing hearing. I don't know if Mr. Rutherford is, is available on the 14th or not, um, but that is a day that I'm available. I have a medical appointment that Friday that I do not need to miss, just as I have a medical appointment the Monday of that week that I really do not need to miss. And I have a federal sentencing on the 13th. And Your Honor, the state's not opposed to that again. I'm not trying to be unreasonable. Obviously, both Mr. Moran and Mr. Rutherford do have a lot of matters. On the other hand, uh, you know, if you don't if you don't swing, you're never going to hit anything. Uh, but I do think, uh, hopefully, I believe in discussing things with Mr. Moore, if we were to restatus this that week, uh, we should maybe have an answer on field on by then, or most likely, I believe. And that would, that would give some clarity to the discussion uh, of scheduling at that time. I'm fairly certain that we'll have a decision well before the 14th, Your Honor. It's not going to shock me if the Fourth Circuit, the government's pleading is due on Friday of this week. We're going to ask to file a reply, and that probably means that we'll file a reply on Monday. Uh, and it will not shock me if we don't have a decision from the Fourth Circuit uh, shortly after Labor Day. And I, I would point out as to the other questions that Mr. Moore raised as to whether or not we were going to try all these together in one county, the answer, first of all, to the county question would be no. I mean, there have been even different counties, and so those are two separate, uh, two separate matters. As to whether or not we would try him with any co-defendant, that being Alec Murdoch, uh, you know, that's not a question I can answer, obviously, because then we're talking about the scheduling uh, of Senator Harpoolian and Jim Griffin. Uh, and my understanding is, my recollection is from that last year we had for Your Honor in Richland County, that uh, Your Honor also set uh, to status that case, that being the white collar cases against Ellen Murdoch, that week as well. So I guess, obviously, that would be a week to get everybody together. The week of uh, September 11th? Yes, sir. And when we had, I'm trying to remember exactly when that was, I think it was in May, we had that hearing in, in uh, uh, Richland County, well, uh, and uh, ultimately um, the discussion then, because Mr. Harbouli again raised that he did not feel that they could try the case in the fall. Of course, of course my point is if we don't do that, then it's going to be the, the summer or fall of 24 before we can uh, try these cases. Uh, and, and at that time, um, you know, the indication uh, and the discussion was that we would status the case uh, the week of September 11th. And so uh, perhaps then we, we need to get uh, them here, and I think they agreed to that at that time, uh, get them here, we can have everybody uh, in one place and sort of figure out our path forward at that time. That would certainly be acceptable to us, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Rutherford. Your Honor, I'd simply ask that you go along with what I believe is our consent request that we schedule the status conference at that time. Yes, sir. Uh, nothing further, Your Honor. We haven't yet addressed anything before the So, your uh, medical appointment you stated, Mr. Um, Moore, is on the 15th? I, I have a medical appointment in Augusta on the 15th and in two in Columbia on the 11th. Two, one of the ones in Columbia on the 11th and the one in, um, in Augusta on the 15th are for the same issue, but the hematologist and one is another specialist, Your Honor. <coughs> and Your Honor, if Your Honor wants it on the 15th, I can call and see if I can reschedule mine. No, I do not want it on the 15th. So that, um, and Your Honor, if you give me a moment, I can tell you what time my sentencing is scheduled on the 13th, if you want. We're going to, well, go ahead. Right ahead. Um, I'm going to call the sentencing hearing before Judge Lewis is scheduled for 
10 o'clock. I don't expect it's going to be a lengthy sentencing. And I would be a hustle to get down to Buford that afternoon, but if I need to, I know how to hustle. Well, I'm thinking that we're looking at the 14th for um, Mr. Fleming and for uh, Murda and for Lafitte yes, sir. in Buford. That would certainly accept for us, and that would be our first. That works for the state. Yes, sir. All right. Well, that's the current plan. Sounds good. Okay. Your Honor, the other thing that Mr. and Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Waters and I will, will talk about is I may at some point make a motion to change the conditions of bond with respect to him using some resources to pay attorney's fees. I will raise that issue with Judge Burgle. Um, and, and I have the figures on the federal restitution amount. I think I understand the potential state restitution amount. And I committed to Mr. Waters and we'll sit down and I'll go over those numbers with him. And if we can reach some sort of consensus, then we'll try to reach some sort of consensus. I don't want to. I don't want to file a motion before your honor without trying to see if I can reach consensus. Again, uh, from the state's perspective, as long as there are sufficient uh, protected resources available in the event that there are convictions to pay any restitution, uh, and the state satisfied in that regard, then, then I think we may be able to reach some sort of agreement. Okay. Very well. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, your honor. Thank you, your honor. Thank you all.